something that we haven't done before for this podcast. What are we up to? Podcast 35 or something? 36, 36 something like that. So we're going to do a, we're doing, going to, this is another episode of the Dog One Podcast. So first off, appreciate you guys listening. Um, we're doing it a little bit differently. If you're listening to it on a podcast app, you won't necessarily notice the difference, uh, except that there's probably a lot of background noise. Um, we're in the truck. We're going, we're actually doing it live on Instagram too, and we've never done that before. So I thought we would do it because, uh, see how that goes. Um, maybe not the best one to try this on, but, um, You'll hear in the background, we've got Bella in the kennel. Um, We took her blanket off of the kennel. We put it on the dash. We wedged a camera into it so that it doesn't bounce around um, because we are filming it with with Ben's camera or the DSLR for this too. So all of a sudden we took the cover off and you can hear Bella. She's nowhere near as settled. Uh, We haven't heard a peep from her the whole ride until now. Um, So we're gonna deal with that. It's one of the things that we're going through with her right now is she settles into the kennel really well. She has since we first got her. But as soon as you take the cover off, um, she she sees stuff and uh, she hears stuff and it becomes a lot more distracting. So it is a challenge uh, and we're just, I've started taking that that cover. It's just a blanket that I use, but I started taking that off. usually when I leave the house. So I let her fuss and whine it out when I'm not there. Eventually she's gonna get the understanding that, you know what, it's not that bad. Just like when we first put her in the kennel, she whined and fussed a little bit, we'd cover it up, she'd fight it out a little bit, and then she'd usually quit. Um, You can hear now, now the other thing that's probably a little bit of a challenge for her is all of a sudden I started talking. This whole time we haven't been, it's been quiet relative, Ben's been sleeping, I've been driving. So we really haven't made much noise. Um, For her, she can see me and she can hear me. There's activity and there's action going on. She's just not liking it. We're not gonna pay attention to it. Um, I'm not gonna reward her for it with any type of attention. Even if it were negative attention. Uh, she would look at it as at least I'm getting some attention. So I have a I have a feeling you'll hear her settle in. I, th- we went through the same thing with Arrow a few weeks ago. Uh, we recorded a podcast with her whining in the back. Within five minutes, she had been quiet. She settled into it, and someone actually commented or messaged me and said I kind of enjoyed or appreciated the idea of that because you showed that. It took a while, but eventually the dog settled in. So, we were gonna, is there anybody on Instagram? 12 people watching. Okay, so we don't have a huge Instagram following. We we tried this live to see how it goes. Um, If you do have questions and you're watching there, fire away. Now, we were gonna talk about a couple things. Um, Our podcasts are, we try to do them a little bit shorter. I don't like real long ones. for us, it's a real, it's a way that we can do kind of short, one topic types of things. In the past, we've always done that, not live, but because of the live part, we're gonna have a little bit of interaction, so if you have questions, uh, that's the value that we're hoping we're bringing to it. But we were gonna talk about our pheasants um, in this podcast, but, and I think we will still, but I kind of pre started it out with Bella because I'm gonna do, a, we're gonna do a little Bella update too. So we'll probably record that as a separate podcast, but um, pheasant update. So we, one of the things that we did this year is we ra- we're raising some pheasants. So we raised, raised about 525 of them. Um, we're, we did it over three batches. Um, if you followed us on Instagram, uh, you've seen probably some of our stories. I've made some posts with it as well. Um, I've done it on, I've sh- shown some of that stuff on Facebook and had a lot of people interested in how it works out for us. So I thought, you know what, I do think it's worth, uh, we've had some things happen recently with it. I think it's worth kind of sharing our experience with it so far. Um, Again, first time I've raised this this many. We've bought flyers in the past. This year we decided we're gonna try to raise some. 
for training, but also for, um, I just want to release them uh, by my house. We have some birds that make it through, but I usually let roosters go. And so roosters make it through the winter into the spring, and then I kind of lose track of them during the summer. But obviously a rooster's never gonna have, have babies. So we bought a lot of hens. We bought about 300 and 375 to 400 hens. Um, and then about 100 to 125 roosters as day old chicks. We raised them with surrogators. Um, so we, we had two surrogators, which is it's a, just a big box. Um, it, you, it has heat, it has water, it has food. You fill it, it's real low maintenance. You fill them, you gotta fill them probably once or twice throughout the five weeks that you have the chicks in there. Uh, and then you basically do what you're gonna do with them. You either release them or you put them into a flight pen. We've got a flight pen that we put some into. Um, but the majority of them, about 350 hens, we're just releasing um, on our property. And so I'll walk you through kind of the process. That was our idea with it. Um, the surrogators, so far, I've been pretty impressed. Um, they're a little bit pricey. I, I'm borrowing them from a buddy um, that, that just wasn't using them anymore. Uh, me personally, I think they're a little spendy. Um, I do like the idea that they're super low maintenance. Like, I don't have to tend to these chicks at all. I put them in there at a day old, I fill the water, I fill the food, I make sure the heat's on. And then I turn the heat down a little bit every week. Uh, it's on like a thermostat and then I just make sure there's food and water in there. But I, so that part I really like. I do think the design is, it could have some improvements and I'm kind of kicking around ideas on that. But all in all, totally worth it from a maintenance standpoint because A, they're, they're safe. There's nothing that can get in that box. The other benefit of it is, is for us, we're trying to release them and it's, if you've ever had pen raised pheasants, they're really dumb. Um, they just, by the end, of, by the time they get older, they're just not afraid of people anymore. They're not afraid of things that they should be afraid of. They become really accustomed to stuff around the house and around vehicles. And most of them get hit by cars, I think, to be honest with you, because they just walk around. Um, that's what we've seen. So these birds have really limited contact we just don't impact them so they they say that like between four and five weeks they start to develop some survival skills um, natural survival skills so by us releasing them at that age and not having much contact with them prior to um, my hope my fingers are crossed that we have a little bit higher success as far as survival now we did, we did the, the 525 birds in three batches, basically. I got chicks delivered this spring, then I had a five weeks later, I had another 150 delivered, and then I had another 200, 225 the following five weeks. So five weeks in between day old chicks is what we ordered. Um, what the first batch, the problem I think we had, and, and I just, I didn't realize it myself, but these day old chicks are pretty hardy when they come to you because they come in a dry cardboard box uh, and it's warm. As soon as you put them in the cold, as soon as they get wet, I think is the biggest thing, they die. Like they, they die really easy, they're pretty fragile. So unfortunately for us, our first batch and our second batch, um, we had an extremely wet spring. So when we went to put these things into the um, surrogator boxes, we were fighting rain and cold. Um, so we had, I, I learned quickly, don't even mess with the elements, like keep them in the little warm box as long as you can, at least until the rain stops, get them into the box, make sure the heater was running so that the box is kind of warmed up um, before you put them in there. So once we did that, like the, the, the casualties we had, the lost chicks that we had were 100% because the chicks either got wet and it doesn't mean they have to get soaked, just a little bit of moisture and then cooler temperatures and they get, they get, they get cold and they die. So we did lose a few early uh, because of the cold and the, and the, and the wetness, I guess, the moisture, the rain. So the, that, once we got past that, we had a little bit of dry weather and they did really good in there. Um, what, what wasn't good was when we got our second batch, the day we got the second batch, 
um, we had heavy rains and cold. And I mean like 50 degrees, 40 degrees, um, and lots of rain. So one of the things that we did was we didn't want to just release them, uh, let them out because it was raining. And they had feathers and stuff, but I just, from going from the, seeing how hard it was on these chicks, we said, let's take, so we took them and we actually put them into our chicken coop. Um, we did release, or did we put, we put them all in there, didn't we, Ben? Most of them. No, we released them very few that first day though in the rain. We put them in the pen because we had to put the chicks in. So we put a ton of birds into that chicken coop and basically let them dry out. And I hung a heat lamp in there. And we basically let them dry out. So they're like four or five weeks old. Uh, they look like they're maybe the size of a, they're not as big as a full fe full grown pheasant, but they're, they're bigger than a quail. And so we put them in there, we put a heat lamp on them, I let them dry out. Then we released some, and then we the next day we released a whole bunch of them. We kept about 30 birds in the in the chicken coop. I got a pretty good sized chicken coop. We kept about 30 pheasants in there. Um, the rest we released, so 125 of them, 150 of them, something like that. We let go. We had rain. We had a day of really good weather, and then we had more rain and cold. If I could do it again, I'd have kept those birds in there for three, four, five days, let it get through that rain let there be at least a couple days of dry weather before I let them out. So what ended up happening was is I did find some birds dead um, out on our property. Now if I found them, there had to be a bunch of them probably that didn't make it. I know some did make it because I flushed some within a week or two of that cold weather. So, but I do think we took a hit there. So the second batch I learned and I went, all right, next time I release them, I'm gonna make sure we got a little bit better weather, a little bit better stretch of weather. So what we did was the second batch, put them in the, put them in the uh, uh, surrogators. They did really well in there. Um, we kind of learned from it. We made sure we kept them warm and dry and all that stuff. And had really, now when I say we lost a few, like we're talking over the course of five weeks, we lost 10, maybe 15 chicks out of 170, something like that. So not too bad. Um, the second group of them, we had less, uh, better survival. And actually uh, the birds, got a lot bigger out of the second batch. Um, the second batch was a lot warmer weather and the birds, the, the actual chicks got twice, they got almost twice as fast that they grow. So I do think that had a lot to do with the, the warmer temperatures. So the second batch did really well. Um, now we released those ones. When those ones got done, we let all, we just let just about all of those go. We kept a dozen maybe, um, put those into the, into the chicken coop. Um, so we ended up with, we had about 30 birds in the chicken coop, about 10 of them to 15 of them were older, a little bit bigger birds. Then we put about 15, 20 of these younger ones in there. So we had about 30 total birds in the chicken coop after the second run. We released the rest of them. Those ones have done very well. Uh, we've, we're flushing them all over the place constantly. So w the weather was warmer. They did a lot better. Um, we left those birds in the chicken coop because we got a flight pen. We have a 100 foot by 45 foot wide fleet flight pen. Um, we planted it with all sorts of, of stuff. Uh, horny buckseed made me a mix to put in there. We put some corn in there. We put um, a mix of all sorts of stuff. It's thick, it's jungle in there. So we thought, man, this is awesome. There's gonna be a lot of food. There's gonna be sources for water, a dew on all the grass. We also put a feeder in there. We put a water in there. Um, I put that in to the pen. We released, we, well, so I'll back up. So we were gone for four days, uh, had water and food in our pen. They, they had plenty of water and food. They could last a week in that chicken coop of mine. And we went down to Deerfest. And when we were down at Deerfest, I came back and there were three birds in it alive. And there was seven recognizable carcasses that were still in the pen. I mean, they something went in there and devoured them. Now you gotta remember, my chicken coop's pretty, pretty tight. Like, 
you, uh, not like a raccoon couldn't get in there, like a cat couldn't get in there. It's it's like a dog pen that's boarded up basically around it. So I couldn't figure out what got in there. Something got in there, pulled 15 of them out and they were gone, gone. And then there was the remains of a few and a couple really scared ones. I let the scared ones go. Couldn't figure out what it was. So I cleaned it out and I said, the hell with it. I'm not putting any more birds in there. Obviously we got some type of a predator issue. So my buddy Chris is raising some birds. He had birds that were 12, 10 weeks old, 12 weeks old, a little bit bigger birds, full grown, uh, close to full grown. So we took 18 of them and we took a dozen pigeons. We brought them over and we put them in the flight pen, into a compartment of the flight pen, 40, 15 feet wide, uh, or 10 feet wide, 45 feet long. It's a third, a quarter of the flight pen total. It's, it's sectioned off though. So we put them in there, put them in there with food, put them in there with water, tons of vegetation, all this stuff. We went back, I went back a day later and they were all in there. Everything was good. I mowed, because it's on some training grounds that we have, I mowed it, I came back and there was dead pheasants everywhere. I thought, what the hell happened here? As I sat there and watched, I saw there were two mink. So in that short of a time period, two mink got into that pen and absolutely cleaned them out. Um, so we've got a little bit of an issue. So what I realized was that had, I'm sure it was a mink that got into my chicken coop and cleaned the ones out at my house. Uh, I w literally watched him pull these birds out, kill them, take them out, kill them, take them out. They're well-oiled machines. They are killers. So. I've got some traps over there right now. I'm not putting another bird in there until we fix the problem. Um, we've caught a skunk so far outside of the pen in a live trap. Um, that, that We've got kind of bears set up right now for the mink. We're gonna have mink boxes in there. So we need to do something with the predators. So the big picture of this thing, so far our success. Now I've got about 170 pheasants right now that are going, going to be three weeks old. <clears throat> so I've got them for another two weeks in the in the surrogators. And by that time, I trust we'll have our predator problem in, in check. Um, and then we're going to put those birds into the flight pen. So our update, I, wa I, I wanted to share, like, I hear, hear people talk about raising birds and you know, what a pain they are and all that stuff. These surrogators help that because they make it a lot lower maintenance, but we have the same issues that everyone else has with predators and that is a huge problem. You can hear Bella, she settled in nice. Now she's throwing a little tantrum again. So we let her kind of wind that out. But so we ran into um, some issues with the birds and our last, now the, what's, what I really like is those birds that we released out of the second batch, the weather was good and they were real strong, like they were healthy, good flyers. Um, and yesterday Ben and I did a, uh, we recorded some training that I did with the dogs and I walked in and to some cover, it's basically set aside grass and we pitched some dummies for dogs and we flushed five or six hen pheasants they were they were had been roosting in that stuff um, we sent the dogs through on a retrieve and flushed some birds I've kicked them up now in multiple places when I'm training or just planting food plots and so we've got a lot of birds around um, we're gonna have this last run of pheasants that a bunch of them are gonna go into the flight pen as long as I feel confident with, I'm not putting any in there until I've got pigeons in there that survive. So we're kind of testing it with pigeons, leaving pigeons in these areas because those mink killed the pigeons too. Uh, they killed the pheasants first, the pigeons second. So we're gonna release pigeons into the pen with traps and until, and I, we're gonna have to catch several, I'm sure. Once we catch a few, as long as the pigeons are making it and we're not losing anymore and we're not catching any more mink or anything else, um, I'll have confidence then to start putting some pheasants in. I'm definitely not gonna put all 100 in or 125 in at one time. We'll probably put 15 to 25 in at a time, make sure that they're surviving, make sure that they're good, and then I'll just 
add some more into it. So I've got kind of this buffer where at my house I can keep them for a little while. Eventually I want to put them in the flight pen. Those are going to be birds that we use for training. Um, we'll use them through the fall. We'll use them for steadiness. Um, we'll make retrieves in the flight pen. We'll we'll use the flight pen for conditioning the dogs and getting the dogs ready for, for birds and, and a lot of distractions. We'll pull birds out of it as we need it for training. Um, we'll do some flushing. We'll do some fresh killed game. We'll do stuff like that training wise. Um, but we've gotten part of the reason we're raising the birds this year is because we've gotten a couple gun dogs in um, just clients that want to do upland stuff and they want to do gun dog work so we need birds for it so instead of buying them this year we're raising them um, it's a reason uh, it just happens to be we still have um, one of our dogs right now Bella you can hear her back there right now um, track she's gonna be a tracking dog she's also gonna be a gun dog she's going to an outfitter um, in Illinois and they do whitetail and waterfall so we're doing both with her so you wanted to do an update on the pheasants did anybody ask any questions or anything on the pheasants so we don't have any questions that's good that's fine if you do have questions we had a lot of direct messages Instagram had a lot of people that messaged about it wanted to hear updates on how the things went um, how how our pheasant raising went this summer so we're two-thirds of the way through it we've got the last batch a couple weeks old um, and we'll get those we'll get through those too but we've kind of it's just a, been a little bit of trial and error uh, we struggled with some of the raising part early on um, I think we've got that dialed in uh, the surrogators I think helped greatly I do think there's some improvements that we're gonna make to them but then now we've run into some problems with the pens. So we'll get those fixed up as well. So I, I thought that would be a quick, easy podcast to kind of share our progress with it. If you have questions on it, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, I certainly am not an expert on it. I learned everything so far from uh, the guy that I'm borrowing, uh, the surrogate is from. He raised a couple thousand birds every summer. Um, we're gonna do it on a much smaller scale this year. Um, 500 was plenty for us to test out. And from that, we'll see how it goes. And, and then and based on our results, which so far have been pretty good, probably do some more of them in the future. May do a couple different types of birds <clears throat> as well. We're doing this remote. We're doing this one in the, in the car. So if the audio doesn't turn out the way we want it to, we've got three different mics going right now. So we're, we don't know which one's gonna sound the best. So we're gonna use the one that we can the best. Um, please continue to send the questions. We're gonna record a few of them. We've got, we're on our way to Buffalo County. We're on our way to our farm, the farm that we hunt. Um, we are going to be putting up licking sticks. Hold egg licking stick is something that I have spent a ton of time recently. It is one of our brands. Uh, it is one of the products that we've patented. Um, it's a deer, deer hunting product. Product. Uh, we are going to be checking cameras for the first time. We're going to be setting more cameras up. We're going to be setting more licking sticks up. And we're doing our fall uh, food plots. So between whole egg licking stick and, and our dog bone sites, um, Instagram, it'll be a lot of stories probably today. Um, we'll probably make some posts out of the content as well. Um, but we're excited. We're going to have our first pull of, of trail cameras. So many of you, I know this is a, a primarily our dog training stuff um, that we cover in the podcast. <clears throat> many of you I know are deer hunters as well. So there's probably some value in that. We're gonna post, we, we did some recordings. We did Deer Fest a couple weeks ago. We teamed up um, with the guys from Browning Trail Cameras, with the guys from Hunt the Break podcast, um, and we did some podcasts there. <clears throat> We're getting the audio from those. One of them, it's really one podcast, but we talk about both, Hold Egg, and we talk about Dog Bone. We'll be sharing that with you. Um, that's a podcast I highly recommend as well, uh, and we'll, we'll kind of plug that one when we, when we post that. But just a quick update, that was a quick one, uh, letting you know where we stand on pheasant farming. So thank you again, you guys, for listening. Um, please do us a favor. 
uh, rate us if you would, uh, subscribe, which whatever platform you're using, uh, whatever app you're using for podcast, if you could subscribe for us, that helps us out greatly with gauging following, gauging um, success as far as are we reaching the people we need to do. Another, uh, we're an organic growth thing. We don't, we don't, we don't have marketing masters by any means. Um, so one of the things that I, I truly appreciate is if you're willing to share um, our podcast. We we do some promos on Instagram and Facebook. If you would share those with someone that you think um, would get some value out of it, we would greatly appreciate it. Thank you for listening. That's the end of a. That was kind of a quick one. Um, that's it. We're gonna we're gonna move on. We're gonna record a couple other ones while we're on the road here. Hopefully, uh, things work out audio-wise. So thank you for putting up with that, um, and thank you for the support. Appreciate it.